Welcome to No Filter. I'm Mia Friedman and this is my therapy session. Did you know 11 million men and women, but mostly women, come on, let's be honest, in the United States use Botox every year? It is a 15-minute or less procedure. And in 2015, 20% of Botox procedures were done on women aged 19 to 39 years old. That's pretty young. Today, I'm speaking to Dana Berkowitz, who is an associate professor at Louisiana State University, and she teaches in the areas of gender, bodies and embodiment, sexuality, families and feminist theories, and she wrote a book called Botox Nation. Her book has just been released, and it's an in-depth look at the crack-like addiction Americans have towards Botox. If you've listened to this podcast, if you've read much that I've written, if you subscribe to my newsletter, which you can get at miafriedman.com.au, you will know that for years now, I have been having a bit of an existential crisis about whether or not to have Botox. I'm 45. I've got lines on my face. I've got the 11s between my eyebrows. And I don't, I'll be honest, I don't like those lines. I've got someone in my life that may be my brother that says to me every time he sees me, you look so tired. Are you okay? And I'm not tired. I'm just 45 and I have a face and it makes expressions and those expressions leave lines. So what do I do about that? Hopefully in this conversation, in this interview today, Dana is going to tell me, she's going to tell me whether I should have Botox or not and Maybe you've had it, maybe you haven't, maybe you, like me, are thinking about it. It's a conversation we need to have. Dana, this is very timely because I am 45 and I am, mm-hmm. this, is, you, this is actually not an interview, it's a therapy session. Just so you, <laughs> just so you know. Um, as were so many of my interviews when I spoke with Botox users, I promise you. <laughs> Yes, I, exactly. So um, I, I'm hoping that we are going to work through some issues together. And at okay. the end of it, I'll um, have a little bit more of a sense. In every interview I do with any woman over about the age of 30, I ask her if I should have Botox, if she has Botox, you really? what I should do. Because I'm very tortured, <laughs> as indeed you were. Now, you were 31. I, yes, I am a tortured, tortured you soul. You are a tortured <laughs> Botox user. Now, you were, you were um, 31 when you first started work on this book, and you started off being strongly opposed to Botox. What, what happened? Well, a few things happened. I think the first thing that happened was I aged. Um, <laughs> you know, and aging in your 30s is... You'd be saying goodbye to your 20s, which is, you know, a fabulous thing. Um, But you see all these new lines on your face um, and you're still thinking of yourself as this, you know, young 20-something-year-old and you're just not anymore. Um, But in addition to that, in addition to what everybody goes through, um, I also, I interviewed Botox users, many of whom were my friends um, Mm. who were around my age who told me I was being foolish, I was being stupid. Um, also how can you write a whole book on Botox without even trying it yourself? Um, and your mom said that to you as well. My mother, my mother. Yes. But anyway, so in addition to all of that, right, I, um, I read, I did a content analysis, as you know, of all these magazines, many of which were, were women's magazines. And, you know, I was inundated with these messages about, um, Botox being preventative, um, and about other messages about, you know, skincare and beauty. And then I also interviewed, um, Botox providers. So, uh, cosmetic surgeons, dermatologists, um, and, and some other, um, physicians and some, uh, nurses, and dentists. And as part of the interview process, I really wanted to put myself into the shoes of people who are going to these providers to get Botox and who mm. are curious about it. So just as they would, I asked them, you know, which of my lines could benefit from Botox. And, you know, they were very quick to tell me which ones. And so <laughs> um, because of all of these reasons, right, and aging, reading all these magazines and talking to people, um, uh, I, too, became really curious about Botox. And then I, too, started using Botox. Did you become curious or did you become paranoid? Both. I don't think you can separate the two. Yeah, it's true. It's very <laughs> true. It's it's always hard interviewing uh, like plastic surgeons or dermatologists because you always feel like they're looking at you. It's it's kind of like the opposite of a guy silently undressing you in his head. It's like they're silently imagining what they could do to make you look better. Right. Right. 
Yeah. <laughs> I, the one time. It's kind of what it was like. I've <laughs> been um, for microdermabrasion before to a dermatologist and uh, they, the nurse gave me a mirror and said, now hold it up. Now tell me what you don't like about your face. And I was just Great. like, oh my God. And I suppose that is something that, that you really explored, this idea of how have we been fed this idea that having lines on our face is inherently unattractive. Exactly. And I think in, in addition to these, these particular lines, um, I think that we have been socialized as women to think about what we don't like about ourselves before we even think about what we do like about ourselves. And with all of this growing technology to, quote unquote, fix every single part of our body, um, I think that the, the pressure to not like ourselves is greater than the pressure to like ourselves. And many people sort of say, oh, Botox isn't surgery. It's, uh, there's no anesthetic. Um, it's nothing's being cut. They don't even count it. As a dis- in a discussion about plastic surgery, they don't even count Botox. It's almost become like dyeing your hair or having laser. Is that part of its appeal, the way it's kind of insidiously become just a no big deal of beauty routines? Yes. I think that it has become configured as on par, not exactly on par with getting a manicure and pedicure, but somewhere in the middle, it's like sort of in this liminal space. And it's also, you know, you can go get Botox and you can go back to work. You can go and have your, you know, your regular day without any downtime. And so that is really part of the appeal. Tell me about the first time you had it. Okay. Okay. Um, well, uh, and I don't write about this in my book, actually, because the first time is I went with a girlfriend um, and I had told her, she was curious about Botox, and I told her that I was working on this book, and I said, you know, I've, a few of the people, the providers with whom I spoke have said that they would give me a good deal on it. Um, and she said, well, I want to go with you. And so we drove to one of the dermatologist's houses, and it was actually this pretty amazing site. So the dermatologist that I interviewed, um, she was pregnant at the time. And it was like August in New Orleans. And so we pulled up to her house. She opened the door in a bikini, like seven months pregnant. And she went into her freezer, got Botox out. We sat in the kitchen. And so she's pregnant in a bikini, (laughs) taking out the Botox from her freezer. And she injected the two of us in our forehead as we're like holding each other's hands. Jane, (laughs) this is like a scene out of Nip Tuck. It was ridiculous. Did it hurt? I mean, there's a needle going into your face. So it feels like a shot. Yeah, right. Um, It feels like a shot. And so for anybody who's had a shot, um, you know, it's not like getting them in your butt or anything because there's a little more cushion there. But, um, you know, it would be less – it doesn't hurt as bad as getting a tattoo. Um, Yeah. But it's not like it's painless. But a bit more than an eyebrow and, wax. Yeah. And then afterward. Where you did you get it? Of, Where did it get did you? get so, it done in your so face? So the first time I got it, I only got it in my uh, glabellar lines. Those those 11s as they call them. Between your eyebrows. Yes. Yep. Yes. And so I only got it there and I had 15 units. And um, I felt a little bit strange afterward. Um she actually didn't use any numbing cream, um, and so my it was a little bit it, it was a little bit painful. Um, and then a few days later is when I started to notice it, and it's this very 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 strange feeling of all of a sudden, you know, every day I would go to the mirror and try to lift my brow and move my face, and and then one day a few days later it became nearly impossible to do so. And how did that feel? <sighs> it felt like. I was ready for the feeling because I had interviewed women and they had said, imagine a post-it on your forehead or imagine a piece of tape on your forehead. And that's really exactly what it feels like. All of a sudden, it just feels like your forehead is tighter. And as hard as you try, you cannot move it. Did you feel a bit sad as a feminist? Not yet, no. First, I was just shocked at the feeling because there really, you know, even though I'm trying to describe it, there's really no words for something, you know, taking over your 
face and not being yeah. able to move it. Then, yeah, I felt guilty the entire time. And mm-hmm. then I remember I went to this a cafe to work on my book. <laughs> and <laughs> I saw somebody who I hadn't seen in a few weeks. And he had said, wow, you look really good. And it dawned on me that that, that is what he was referring to. And how did you feel about it, that? Did you feel like you cheated? I totally felt like a cheater, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you feel like you have this, like, weird, I don't know, b- bionic face or something, that you were doing something that other people didn't do and that you have this secret. Um, and then, of course, as a feminist, I felt like I was totally failing at all of these feminist ethics that I had, you know, that I preach in my classroom. Mm. Mm. And you had to come out to your students, didn't you? Yeah. And so I didn't for a while. I kept it secret. To my students to, and to my colleagues, um, I kept it a secret. And then as time went on, I realized that I am dealing with all of these feminist tensions and so many other women are as well. And so many other women with whom I spoke in my, in my study identified as feminists. And they too are dealing with these issues. And so even though my students are much younger and they can't even imagine getting Botox, um, they do engage in such, uh, you know, disciplinary body practices as shaving their legs or even getting laser hair removal, mm. um, putting on makeup and wearing particular clothing and all these things that we don't really think about as, as invasive as Botox. Um, but in fact, there are so many similarities Because for so many women who use Botox over and over again, it becomes routine just as removing body hair does. And so we were able to make a lot of these connections with them. And so I'm really glad that I did so. It does feel in some ways arbitrary that we feel guilty about Botox, but we don't feel guilty about shaving under our arms or wearing makeup or dyeing our gray hair, for example. Right. Or trimming our eyebrows or doing a whole lot of things that are unnatural to our faces and our bodies. But... What about this idea of it moving the goalposts and it changing what is normal for all women? This is why I think it's um, really problematic, this increasing normalization of Botox, because in addition to it, um, it fostering this lifetime consumption of preventative aesthetics, which I talk about extensively in my book, I think that, um, you know, B- Botox costs about three hundred, four hundred dollars each time you use it, mm, and it's about the um, same in Australia. It and it needs to be continuously topped off, right? Mm. So two to three times a year. So say it can cost about a thousand dollars a year. Mm. Most women are without the time or resources to provide themselves with even the minimum of what this mm. regimen requires, um, and this this occurs in in America in um a very socially stratified society in which many of our citizens don't even have access to basic health care. And so I think what it's doing is increasing this inequality on bodies because we assume that people who look good, people who are beautiful Mm. are healthier. Therefore we assume that they are more responsible and have more value in society. Certainly Mm. as women, right? Exactly. Exactly. Is, is Botox a white girl thing? Because I've not heard it discussed much in terms of the African-American or Asian communities. Yeah, so it is. It is um, the vast majority of users are white women. I th- and I don't have the numbers in front of me, so I, I can't give you an exact but number. Do but do African-American get, think it's about, women get Botox? Yeah, I think it's about, um, it, it's like 7%. Um, right. So it, it's, really, it's really quite small. And the reason, there's lots of reasons for this. Um, first of all, one, it does have to do with economic equality because, Mm. um, inequality because in America, class and race are so inextricably intertwined. Mm. Um, a second has to do with the way it is marketed. Uh, There are mostly white women in these advertisements. Um, and also I heard a lot, I asked dermatologists and cosmetic surgeons about this, um, you know, the, um, the racial distribution um, and demographics of Botox users, they repeated time and time again the, the adage, um, you know, black don't crack. 
Yeah. Um, I was thinking yeah. That. And so I heard this um, a lot. Um, and, so and Asian women infa- and, and African American women just age better than white women, right? Or even Latina women, right? That, that, that they have darker skin, yeah. um, and so they are not subject to the the sun damage yeah. um, that white women are. This is a little bit tricky though because. The wrinkles that Botox is designed to "quote unquote" fix or remedy, it's not that it's not those wrinkles um, that are caused by loss of volume or by loss of sun damage. It's actually caused by those wrinkles that are caused by facial expression. Uh. Oh yes, and, um, <laughs> and I'm so expressive. Um, and so and so that that notion that black don't crack because of um, their their darker skin tone and because of sun damage that actually doesn't hold true. Because Botox is for those um, facial lines that are from facial expression. And I don't think there's any racial differences in the way that we express ourselves yeah. and express our emotions. Which which um, is, is, I suppose, one of the biggest fundamental issues so many people have with Botox, right? Is that it's yes. unlike removing hair from your legs or dyeing your, your grey roots. It is about erasing women's facial expressions. Yeah, and that's um, that's really f-ed up. That yeah, women women can't look bitchy or angry or perplexed yeah. or inquisitive. Um, and I devote a, quite a bit of time in the book mm. to talking about this. And I call it. There's a whole section that says like, no more bitching, bitchy resting face. So I don't. Is this an international thing? Absolutely. Face? <laughs> okay. Ab- okay. We, I think um, we call it resting bitch face, but similar. It's the same. Thing. Uh, yeah. No. There's two names. There's actually two names yeah. for it. <laughs> we have it too. <laughs> um, it is so sexist that it has two words. Um, <laughs> and so. Um, yeah, so this, I guess this, you know, global thing of bitchy resting face or resty bitch face, right? It's this, like, pop cultural idiom um, that refers to a woman's face at rest that somehow looks bitchy simply because she's not smiling. Um, and, of course, there's no name for for men's serious, uh, pensive, and reserved expressions because we allow men these feelings. Mm-hmm. Um, women are always expected to be smiling. And um, and never looking angry or tired. Never looking angry or tired, right, or worried yeah. or inquisitive or any of these things, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so what Botox does was, is um, it prohibits movement on the top part of the face. It prohibits that movement of scowling, of furrowing, um, and so, um, because of this, I'm arguing that it actually like liberates the face from its bitchy resting state. Um, so we always look the, serene and in repose. It always looks and placid. Happy. And so this actually, it's it's kind of interesting because it has some really troubling fascinating consequences yeah in that um one woman who was a professor with whom i spoke um told me that her course evaluations her student evaluations soared after she got botox because she was not able to make that you know what the hell are you talking about face (laughs) um to her students so she was more like she appeared more likable she was more likable yeah, I know. And this is where it becomes a real feminist problem, isn't it? And a exactly. p- sort of a part exactly. of the, the patriarchal bargain where it can benefit oh. individuals. So the person in the coffee shop that says, Dana, you look fantastic. And the woman whose students give her higher approval right. ratings. Right, higher approval. And then, right, she gets higher approval. Yeah. Um, she This will go into her tenure and promotion file. Yeah. This will help her career. Yeah, literally. Yeah. But does it – but it but it actually serves – to set women it's, back overall yes, because yes, it makes yes. what's what's defined as a desirable woman and an attractive woman narrower and narrower and narrower and, and narrower. Yeah, and available yes. to only, as you say, a certain number of people. Certain, exactly. Well, that's cheerful. I know. And yeah. it's, you know, I, I don't end the book. The book does not end with happy thoughts no. at all. And, I, and particularly okay. since I think this is only going to get worse. worse. I was driving in rural Montana this past summer and I saw advertisements for Botox and I saw a medical spa. And I think that it's going to become marketed and available more and more to the masses. Have you ever seen Botox ads? It's like um, one says, 
it's really up to you. It took you 40 years to get that wrinkle, but you know, 10 seconds to do something about it. Oh. Um, so the, the, the pressure is all on the individual to do something about these wrinkles. Um, others read, you know, freedom of expression, um, <sighs> sort of debunking that idea that Botox yeah. limits your ability to express yourself. Um, and, and to- again, it's, it's mostly women in their I would say women in their white women in their forties who are in these advertisements. Do they have? Um, do these ads appear in younger? I mean, women's magazines aren't really relevant anymore. Um, women are on the internet, as we know. But do right. these, do these ads appear in young women's magazines like your Cosmos and your Glamours and your yes. Vogue's? Yes, all over the place. Right, yes. but they're. I mean, they're not in like Seventeen magazine or Teen magazine. Yes. Um, right, but they they are in um, magazines that cater to women in their twenties. So absolutely, I, I, tell me about this idea of of marketing to young women because who is getting Botox and obviously the, the the manufacturers and the providers want that market to be as wide as possible so they're trying to get as many women as possible. Is there an active target for younger women? I cannot necessarily say that for sure, but what I have found in my research um, is that they are very stealthily um, targeting women in their 30s, I would say. Um, and I saw this in, again, in the, in the pages of magazines. And I saw this, um, when I spoke to Botox providers, um, because I heard things like in in the magazines, Botox is a preemptive strike. You Mm want to, um, think of your face as a house. You want to, you know, speckle the walls before the roof just, you know, caves in. Um, and you, so you also I, heard this, like the analogy of you want to clean up your room before it becomes too dirty. You want to clean dirty. up your room before it gets dirty. Um, I, this is another one that I can't remember the exact words, but it was like uh, uh, some, something on the, on the, along the lines of like, you want to go to the doctor before you go to the cardiologist or something, or a lot of people mm-hmm. wait till they have a heart attack to go to the cardiologist. I think that was one. Um, I, I think I know more women in their 20s and 30s who have it than women in their 40s. And yeah. I think women yeah. in their 40s are more torn about it, but women in their 20s and 30s just say, and they say it's preventative. It's preventative. Is it exactly. actually preventative? So it's complicated. Um, it's preventative if you keep getting it every, you know, four to six months or three to six months um, for the rest of your life. Um, and so mm. it's preventative in the sense that you won't be able to make that expression and you won't get those, those 11s. Um, but once you stop, it's not like it prevents aging. Nothing can prevent aging. We're all going to age. Um, and we're all going to wrinkle. And But are we, if prevents- our faces are paralyzed, will we wrinkle if we can't make frowns and laugh? Well, our enti- it won't paralyze our entire face. It can't do that mm. um, because we need to talk. Um, we need to blink our eyes. Um, and so you end up, uh, recruiting from different facial muscles. And so you inevitably will get wrinkles elsewhere and you still will lose volume in your face. Tell me Um, about, tell me about bunny lines. Oh, the bunny lines. Well, those, I don't you love it. They have this, these cute little names for every wrinkle. We have the, you know, the 11, the crow's feet, the bunny lines, the parentheses. Because the bunny lines, (laughs) which are those, (laughs) those little whiskery lines that women get at the top of their nose, that's a dead giveaway that a woman's had Botox, right? Yes, because she's pulling from there. Exactly. Or there's another line um, that just like occurs right. And this is, I'm starting to see more and more of both on myself and on others that I can tell if they've had Botox, it's this one tiny vertical line right above the brow. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny line that comes because once Botox wears off, you can still move your eyebrows up a little, and, but you can't scowl. And so you get this little, little, little line. Um, so it's causing these other lines to so, form. And then do you want to go and get those lines filled? Yeah, of course you do. Yeah. Um, because you have this very you know acute awareness of of your different wrinkles in ways that we didn't have before Botox. I think all wrinkles were kind of created equal, right? We didn't have, I don't know when we started naming all of these different lines on our face. Yeah, exactly. And, (laughs) and, and, you know, that's where it becomes 
It, did you find that Botox is indeed a gateway drug to other cosmetic procedures? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I heard things like, first up, Botox, next up, fillers. Yes. Um, yeah, and I heard it is addictive. I went to the American Academy of, of Dermatology annual meeting, and I went up to the um, Allergan counter. Um, Allergan is the manufacturer. Is the, is the only is the company that owns and manufactures Botox, and they had this beautiful, like, living room um, set up there. And um, everybody, and you know, all the reps were just, you know, these lovely, lovely people um, in these um, very put together outfits. And I, you know, I went up to this woman and I started talking to her, and I did not. I was I sort of undercover. I didn't say that I was mm. um, researching a book. And I said, you know, I was curious about Botox. And she said, you are going to love it. And once you start, you won't ever stop. <sighs> yeah. So that so is coming out of the mouths of um, the manufacturer. Rep, so a good rep herself. Yeah. It's like crack um, or tobacco yeah. in terms of they yeah. are wanting to, the, the manufacturer wants to get as many people hooked on it as early as possible because that's yes. going to make them even more of a fortune, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And it's funny because of all of the things um, I've been following a little bit of the press um, from my book, and particularly an interview that I did um, with the Guardian a few weeks ago. And it's there is this one quote from a woman in my book who says, "It's amazing how addictive it is." Um, and then I ask her how often she goes back for um, injections, and she laughs and she says, "I'm kind of crack like about it." And, uh, but it and feels so, kind of sinister, doesn't it, in, in a way, because it's like it is addictive. We're trying to hook women on it. We're trying to change the beauty standard so everyone has to do it if they want to exactly. compete because suddenly what it looks like to be 40 isn't what it actually looks like to be 40 unless you buy Botox. And I, exactly. it's all the thing about having Botox. you got to buy it. It's a product that you – it's a drug it's that you've got to buy. Yeah, it, and it's – yes. And it's expensive and it's, it's you know, not only a cash cow for Allergan, yeah. um, it's a cash cow for uh, not just dermatologists, not just plastic surgeons, but, you know, there's increasing ER doc, emergency room doctors, ob um, mm. all of these doctors who are... Dentists. I have a friend who gets a Reeling to yeah. from declining insurance reimbursements and they are very accustomed to living a particular way of life and more and more and more of them are going into cosmetics. Congratulations, you're pregnant. Um, now what? Mamma Mia is excited to announce the impending arrival of a brand new addition to the Mamma Mia podcast network, a show all about pregnancy. We want to include you. What's the stuff that no one told you about? The best piece of advice you received? Your crazy and weird pregnancy or delivery story? And what did you discover in the first six weeks at home? It can be funny, poignant, emotional, or just plain weird. Join us in making the best pregnancy and birth show you've ever heard. Your story and advice could change the lives of millions of Australian women who get up the duff and then go, "Uh uh-oh. Email us, podcast at mamamia.com.au or call the pod phone on 02899-9386. Tell us your name and a little bit about your story. That's podcast at mamamia.com.au or the phone line 02899-9386. So it's awards season and I want to talk about Hollywood for a Mm. second because um, Hollywood is very much, they do very much establish beauty standards. Renee Zellweger, we talked about this yesterday on Hot Topics. There's a big debate as to whether she's had plastic surgery or not. Meg Ryan is sparking a new conversation about women and aging in Hollywood. This is 41-year-old Cameron Diaz. She says she's tried Botox before, but she didn't like the way it made her look, so she doesn't use it anymore. Tell me, so tell me a little bit about I, that, about the connection between celebrities and Botox. Yeah, I mean, so we're obsessed with celebrity culture, right? Yeah. Um, and um, even more now that we have, like, access to their, to their everything. And, you know, celebrities, they don't get beautiful in private anymore, you know, particularly with these manufactured celebrities and reality shows. You know, everyone sort of gets beautiful in public. Um, and, and part of our obsession with celebrity culture is our desire to emulate it. Mm. Um, so that, that's one dimension. The other dimension is I feel terrible and awful, and I would never want to be a celebrity 
in my late 40s and early 50s. Because mm-hmm. there is a point at which you're, you age. Mm-hmm. No matter how much Botox you use, no matter how much filler you use, um, you're going to age. And so there's, there's, that, there's that moment where they have to decide, am I going to go overboard? Because ultimately it's going overboard. Or am I just going to stop? And we don't make because it easy for them, do we? Because if they if they let themselves yeah, either age, way, they're totally screwed. Yeah. No. And, 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 you know, you have the Renee Zellwigers and the yeah. Nicole Kidmans who are criticised for the work that they apparently have and not looking the same. Natural, not looking natural. Not looking, not looking natural. The same, right? And then yeah. anyone – I mean, it is lose-lose. So uh, it, it, yeah. all roads lead to humiliation. Yeah, exactly. And that's really – that's – Really, the worst part of it is like so many of the women that I spoke with, you know, talked about like they're just really stuck between a rock and a hard place. Because we've got, um, they've got to look young, but but we they can't look like they've had work. They can't is look that exactly? What about women who lie about it? What about celebrities who lie about it? Because they do have to seem like they're not trying. So right. you know, there was a very famous quote from Nicole Kidman where she said, "I've never had anything. I just use sunscreen." And I think a few years later. Um, she admitted having used Botox like once. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's this trap that we set for women where they can't age, but they can't admit to having work. And then when they lie about it, we destroy them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I am, um, you know, and we don't hold men to these standards. Mick Jagger <laughs> gets to prance on stage with like a leather face and we still swoon over him <laughs> i noticed at the golden globes it was really interesting to see hugh grant looking mm. like his age like it was my yeah. first my first reaction yeah. was oh goodness doesn't he look like he's let himself go and then i went that's just what happens when you don't have surgery and injections and fillers and botox yeah with you you know what's really interesting if you go back and you look at tv shows from the 1990s yeah and you look at women and, and men in their 40s, it's just, it's incredibly different. It's incredibly different. Their foreheads move. So, their faces are not filled. Yeah. I mean, it, and just, you know, within the past you know, 20 years, we've seen major, major changes in celebrity faces. And of course, because of the way this trickles down, we're going to see major, major changes in just, you know, regular women's and men's faces. When people call having Botox a feminist choice, what's your reading on that? Oh, God. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, a lot of women I spoke to said, Botox is empowering. It's my choice. I'm doing this for myself. Nobody is telling me I have to do this. I'm not doing this to please a man. I heard that a lot. Yeah. Um, but I think that... Um, the and pressures placed on us to comply with dominant beauty norms are painfully obvious. Yeah. Yeah. But, so but I, don't everywhere. Think it's a, I don't think it's a choice. I can't I don't think I, – I think that in talking about it as a feminist choice is really, really problematic and really, really flawed. Because? Because when I read these magazines, when I spoke to Botox providers, I saw – how this choice is very much uh, cultivated by this, this structural demand. Mm. And did you feel- choices don't occur within a context um, of where we don't have gender inequality, pervasive gender inequality? Did you um, did you feel empowered we- by your Botox? No, I didn't feel empowered. <laughs> <laughs> empowered. You just felt hotter. <laughs> no, um, I felt a little a little prettier. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I did not feel empowered. No. <laughs> I want to come back to your Botox journey. Um, yeah. So you had it. You had it. How old were you the first time you had it? It was 33 or 34. And then what's been the process? Did you, okay, you become so addicted? I stopped. Yeah, I stopped for about a year. And then I, um, I've had it four times in the past four years. I don't think I'm going to get it again. Um. I can move my eyebrows right now. Um, I cannot yet scowl. I'm at, I'm at that point where I can move my eyebrows up and down, but I cannot furrow. Um, and I, I kind of want to see what it's like again to be able to furrow my brow. Um, 
and be able to express that bitchy sense of myself that I so love. Um, and also in, in terms of wanting to, and again, I'm going to get really personal here in, in terms of, I was recently married. Um, I'm thinking about starting a family and having children. And there's research that says that babies need to read facial expression on their mothers. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, children need to know when mommy's pissed off, let me tell you. Yes. Yeah, of course. I, yeah, and, um, I, and I worry about that. I worry that we're raising a generation of children with Botox mothers yeah, who think that yeah. women are serene, women's faces exactly. are serene and women's, that women don't and have women's emotions. Women's faces are step for wives. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's troubling, yeah. And what does that and teach I think our so daughters it, or our exactly sons? Exactly what I was saying and I think it's our responsibility to raise our daughters and our yeah. sons. And our sons. Yeah, and our sons, yes. What was your, what to, was your husband's view of you having Botox? Oh, God, he, he hates it. I, I love him so much for it. I don't know a man who he, likes And he's it. a doctor. I should also tell you that he's a doctor. He can tell immediately when I've had Botox and he, he despises it. Why does he despise it? Because he loves me for, for the crazy expressions I make on my face. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I, that's why I married him and I have to remember that. Um, I, I, of the women you spoke to, um, how many of them – hide their Botox from their partners? A few of them did. Mo, you know, the vast majority did not, but a few of them did. And I think, I think that the, those who did, I don't think they can hide it anymore as you get older. Like the ones who did, they were young enough so that yeah. they can hide it. Yeah. But I don't think, you know, I, I would be interesting to talk to them again and see if, how honest they are with their husbands or their partners um, because you, you cannot hide it as you get older. Okay, I'm going to ask you if there's a feminist way to have Botox. Are there some guiding principles about approaching Botox? Is it that you should be transparent and you should be honest about it? When someone goes, yeah, you look great. Should you say, well, yeah, I've had Botox rather than going, oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, so I think that's one way. Yeah, that's it. I've never actually thought about this. Is there a feminist way to get Botox? Um. There has to be, right? Um, I think in – because I don't just think this – I don't think that everybody's just going to say, okay, I'm a feminist, so I'm just not going to get it. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't preclude you from being a feminist, anything right, that you do to your face. Right. I mean, that's got nothing to do with so, being a feminist. I do think, yeah, in like saying, yeah, I get Botox and this is why. Um, that that might be one because of the way patriarchy. To, yeah, I, because <laughs> because of the, I'm, not, but no, I'm just saying because of the patriarchy. But because you know what, um, I have to stay on TV or I yeah. have to keep this job, um, and I know that I am judged on my looks. Yeah, and I know that there is a gender double standard of aging. Um, but see, and I'm, I know that I'm, I'm going to get, make more money and get a promotion, and I know that in so doing. That my the consequences of my actions are such that um, that they are problematic, that they are raising the bar for other women. Um, I, th- I guess in acknowledging that for everybody, maybe. <laughs> I think maybe I we just I need to a have answer. a little flyer. I wish I had a better answer for this question. <laughs> that you print out. So everyone that goes, hey, you look good, go, here, read this. <laughs> read this, yeah. <laughs> Do straight women get Botox more than gay women? There's women. no statistics on that. Did you notice any anecdotally in your research yes, talking to women? Yes, I suspect. I suspect that the answer is yes because I think that in um, in queer communities, um, particularly in queer uh, in lesbian communities, yeah. we do have um, more flexible standards of beauty yeah. and, and and bodies. Um, but I don't. I don't know the answer to that. I would love to do an, a, a project on that. So no more Botox for you for a while. You're going to make babies. Yeah. It's not safe when you're pregnant or breastfeeding, is it? It's not safe when you're pregnant or breastfeeding. Um, oh. And so, how I long before that, you get pregnant do you have to have it out of your system? I don't know the answer to that actually. Mm. But I'm 38 right now, and I want to move to a new phase in my life, and I also want to just sort of for a little bit forget about these. This, this one beauty standard that I've, you know, put on myself or that everyone else puts on me. So how is the therapy session going? I, it's going well. I'm still completely <laughs> conflicted. I'm still completely it's, conflicted. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know if I'll mm. ever resolve it. And it's interesting that you say you didn't resolve it. You had it, I'm, but you were still yeah. conflicted and you are still conflicted now. I, and I think, that's, I think it's okay in saying, like, I don't have an answer. Yeah. And I don't have a resolution. And because 
you know, this is, we are always becoming. We are not just, you know, we don't just stop becoming who we are. Mm -hmm. Um, And the tentacles of the beauty industry and the cosmetic surgery industry and all of these industries, they're, they're so vast and they keep, they keep, touching us and wanting to play with us and <laughs> affecting us. Um, and that's not going to stop. And these are issues that we're always going to have to be resolving. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. And uh, and we need to just keep talking about it, don't we? Yeah, I think that these conversations are great. This has been so fun. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Dana. I love talking to you. And um, congratulations on your wedding, yeah. Mazel Tov. Thank and, you. Oh, thanks. thanks. And um, <laughs> I will hopefully talk to you soon and maybe meet you one day. Thank you. See you. Right, bye. Bye. <laughs> bye. Thank you so much for listening to No Filter. I really don't know if I'm any closer to deciding whether or not I'm going to have Botox. I just, I can't imagine having it and feeling okay about it. I know I'd feel satisfied that I looked better, in quote marks, younger, but I don't know. I'm conflicted. But that doesn't mean that I judge you if you've had it. We live in difficult times. You can find Dana's book, Botox Nation, by going to apple.co forward slash Mamma Mia. And that's where you'll find all of our shows in one place. And you'll also find any books written by the many Mamma Mia team. And soon you will find mine. And I got a lot of extra lines on my forehead while writing that. If you like this episode and you want to hear more like it, you should scroll back through the feed. I've asked lots of women how they feel about Botox and whether I should get it. Look for my conversation in particular with Australian icon Ida Buttrose where I ask her permission to get Botox and she basically tells me to shut the hell up. It's really up to you. If you're not happy, if you're not happy about something yeah. and there's, there's a surgical procedure that might help you, then you don't have to tell your daughter. Anyway, we, mm. we do not, I do feel with great respect. But a lot of younger women do overshare. Now, did you know all our podcasts are now available on Spotify as well? I love Spotify. So if you get sick of listening to the best of Bieber, never, actually always, come on over. Of course, the best way to get them, the easiest and the fastest, is on the Mamma Mia podcast app. It's pink. It's a one-touch place with all our shows. And you know what? Next time you're with a girlfriend or with your mum or with your sister, take her phone, install the Mamma Mia podcast app, and take a, get someone to take a photo of you doing it or take a screenshot of you doing it and send it to us. If you want to suggest a guest or just ask me a question or send me a photo of you or tell me a story about who you downloaded the podcast app onto their phone, call the pod phone on 02 899 9386 or flick me an email at podcast at mamamia.com.au. Today's show was produced by the incredible Eliza Ratliff who spent this whole interview touching her forehead with her fingers in the same way that I have. She's way too young for Botox and she hasn't had it. The executive producer of podcasts is Monique Bowley, who has had Botox before. Just a little sprinkling. And the head of entertainment is Holly Wainwright, who hasn't. This is not name or shame. I do not judge you if you've had Botox or you haven't had Botox. It's a choice. It might not be a feminist choice, but it's not an anti-feminist choice. It really has nothing to do with feminism your choice to have Botox or not. Botox has something to do with feminism, but your choice to have it or not does not. We clear about that? Excellent. Lots of love. I'll see you next week. Bye.